because uh, we're at that point on our agenda where we go for member statements. And the first statement this morning from a member is the member from University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. Ontario and Canada's lakes are fundamental to our life, our health, and the health of the environment. Yet every day we pump pollutants into our Great Lakes system mercury, hard metals, toxins, and plastic, including microplastic. The most common type of microplastic are microfibers that are shed from our clothes in the washing machine and then released in our waterways and Great Lakes system. These plastics ends up, end up in our fish, birds, oysters, and then they move up the food chain to us. We need to take action to protect our health and safety and our waterways. That is why I introduced a bill, Bill 279, with my friend, the MPP for Kingston and the Islands, to require all new washing machines to be equipped with a cheap filter that captures up to 87 per cent of microfibers and stops them from entering our wastewater system and then our lakes. These microfilters work. We know this because of the pilot that was conducted in households in Parry Sound by Georgian Bay Forever. I want to thank the leadership and the staff and the volunteers of Georgian Bay Forever. I also want to thank Lisa Erdl, a researcher at the University of Toronto, and I want to thank the townships that are right now passing resolutions in support of this bill, including Archipelago and Seguin. And I also want to thank Jen Pettersen from Fashion Takes Action. This movement is growing, and I urge you to join. If we truly want to protect Canada and Ontario's lakes from harmful microplastics pollution, the Ontario government must pass our bill to install microfilters on washing machines. Let's get it done. The next member statement, the member from Markham Unionville. Thank you, Speaker. For over 70 years, World Vision has worked with communities and partners to help kids and families across the world rise out of poverty. I've been a World Vision volunteer for over 30 years and currently sponsor six kids. This organization has a special place in my heart. Six kilometers is the average distance a woman or a child in the developing world walks for water. Too often, the water obtained is not clean to drink. This year, the 2021 Global 6K aims to fund clean water projects in Democratic Republic of the Congo and Haiti. Speaker, I want to thank everyone who donated to Markham Unionville's Walk for Clean Water fundraising event. In the combination with four teams, Billy Peng and Friends, Grace Chinese Gospel Church of North York, People's Grace Church, and Marie and Winnie Zamba Dance. We raised over $45,000 to support this great initiative. Let's continue to support and change lives one day at a time. Thank you. Further member statements, the member for Niagara Centre. Speaker, Christine and Dave Hunt have one simple goal to find a safe, affordable place to live. After falling victim to a rental scam, they lost $1,400, money they needed to secure a rental. Since then, they've had to live with family in Welland after being refused at over 20 apartments in the Niagara region. Christine and her family are far from alone. My office hears from countless families who are having a nearly impossible time finding a safe and affordable place to live. Seniors and those on fixed incomes are increasingly having a hard time with the rising cost of living and unsustainable rental increases. Since this government was elected in 2018, the cost of a rental has increased dramatically, and statistics recently released from the Canadian Real Estate Association showed that the cost of buying a home in Niagara has increased 121 per cent in the last five years. Speaker, we know that Ontario's municipalities cannot solve the affordable housing crisis alone. This legislature has the opportunity to take action and tackle this crucial issue in our communities by investing in social housing, investing in affordable housing stock, and by expanding the ability of municipalities to use inclusionary zoning. Housing is a human right, and people in Ontario shouldn't have to sacrifice an arm and a leg to put a roof over their head.
Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Brampton West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is a subject that is very personal to me and many Canadians with South Asian origin. I want to talk about an individual who was the first turban-wearing student to graduate from Harvard University, an individual who dedicated his life to fighting for a just society, and an individual who is known as one of the first ambassadors of Sikhism to the Western world. Speaker, his name is Sant Teja Singh Ji. He was an educator by profession who preached hard work and honest living. In the early 20th centuries, Sant Teja Singh Ji played a vital role in helping South Asian migrants in Canada achieve permanent residency. Without his valiant efforts, there would not be such a strong and vibrant South Asian presence in Canada today. As a result of his esteemed efforts, the province of British Columbia has declared July 1st as Sant Teja Singhi Day. Through you, Speaker, I would like to take the chance to appreciate his many achievements. As a Canadian with South Asian origin myself, I'm well aware that I would not be in the position I'm today without the selfless efforts of Sant Teja Singhji. He was truly a man ahead of his time who served humanity without any distinction of caste, creed, race, or color. His life was his message to the world. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. I was recently joined on a beautiful fall day by the leader of the official opposition, the MPP for Hamilton West Ancaster Dundas, councillors from the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation, Regional Councillor Dias, ENAP, and many community and environmental voices at Carruthers March in Ajax. We were there to commit to protecting this vitally important area and to adding the Carruthers Creek headwaters to Ontario's Greenbelt when the Ontario NDP formed government in 2022. Before the change in government, however, I wish it were possible to convince this current anti-environment PC government to protect these headwaters. I'm not optimistic, however. After the war we had over Duffins Creek, and this Premier has paved over wetlands and farmlands, giving his buddies what they want, come hell or high water, and there will be high water. This Premier has slashed flood prevention programs by 50 per cent and has hobbled conservation authorities. Even though the now MPP for Ajax publicly committed to bringing the Carruthers Creek headwaters under the protection of the Green Belt when he was campaigning in 2018, just like other local PC party campaign promises, they don't hold water. Unlike wetlands, Speaker. People and businesses in the area should be saved the heartache and cost of flooding. Building on the Carruthers Creek headwaters will increase downstream flooding in Ajax, an average of 77 per cent, as high as 113 per cent in one region, according to the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority watershed study. The Carruthers Creek headwaters are comprised of prime agricultural lands containing sensitive hydrological features, and it is completely surrounded by the Greenbelt. The watershed is vulnerable and invaluable. We must protect it. So, government, please, please add the Carruthers Creek headwaters to the Green Belt. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Speaker, today, on behalf of my constituents in Scarborough Guildwood, I stress the urgent need for a new hospital in Scarborough. A year ago, I asked the Minister of Health to advance funding to support our new hospital, and we are still waiting. Most of our hospital buildings were built between the 1950s and 80s. Today, our hospital ranks at the very bottom of facilities conditions. We need an urgent response to move forward with Scarborough Health Network's renewal plans. Just last week, I visited Scarborough's oldest senior, 110-year-old old Ms. Dora Skeen, who was at the Scarborough General site. While on the seventh floor tower, I couldn't help but notice the narrow space that was crammed in with patients, nurses, PSWs, and other staff. They were doing their best to make use of every inch. I met a dedicated PSW and nurse, Natalie, who who specializes in treating the feet of diabetes patients to save their limbs. It is my hope that we provide conditions that better support her work. Thank you to the Scarborough Health Network and all the frontline workers for their perseverance in fighting this pandemic amidst facilities challenges. We owe so much to these frontline workers for saving lives and keeping us safe. Their team have vaccinated almost 600,000 individuals, conducted over 400,000 tests, and admitted th over 3,000 patients to treat COVID. The SHN has created the 2030 Future of Our Facilities Plan, which specifies a vision for a new and expanded hospital facility. I urge the government to accept their proposal and not leave Scarborough behind. Thank you. Next statement, the member for Peterborough-Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
On a number of occasions during the three and a half years that I've represented Peterborough Kawartha, I've had the distinct privilege to rise in this House to thank some extraordinary individuals for things that they have done. Today I'd like to talk about two individuals from the Peterborough Police Service, PC Steve Minima and PC Dave Wickman. At approximately 4.30 in the afternoon on August the 4th of this year, PC Minima and PC, PC Wickman arrived at PRHC on a completely unrelated matter when they saw a man fully engulfed in flames trying to get to the hospital emergency department. PC Minima and PC Wickman were able to intercept the man and extinguish the flames before he entered the hospital. This allowed hospital staff to assist him without the poten potential for additional injuries had he been able to get into the emergency room before the flames were extinguished. The actions of these two officers not only saved the life of this man, but they also prevented injuries to others who were in the ER department waiting room. Speaker, most of us would have turned and ran when we saw someone running at us engulfed in flames, but not PC Minima and PC Wickman. They quickly recognized what needed to be done and immediately jumped into action. They ran towards the flames, extinguished the fire, and saved the man's life without concern for their own. From the bottom of my heart, PC Minima and PC Wickman, thank you. Your actions were truly heroic. Thank you. Member statements, the member for Brantford, Brampton Centre. Brampton. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. It's an honour to rise here on behalf of the people of Brampton Centre and I'd like to take a moment to thank all of those that work in our food banks in our local community. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, Angie Rahal, the Acting Executive Director at Seva Food Bank, Gord Warren, the Chairman at St. Andrew's Food Bank in Brampton, as well as Annie Bino uh, at the Knights Table for the tremendous work that they have done to help serve our vulnerable community. Speaker, as you know, um, food bank usage has increased across our province and across the country. Food Banks Canada, um, through their Canada Hunger Count uh, of 2021, estimates that uh, there was a 20% increase in uh, food bank usage uh, across the nation, with one in four locations experiencing a 50% increase in demand. Now, we know that the pandemic has been difficult on individuals in our communities. The rising cost of food, stagnant wages, business closures have made it harder and harder for people to get by. So I'd like to take this opportunity to encourage encourage all members here to donate and encourage others in your community to donate to our local food banks, but more importantly, that we continue to fight against low-wage policies that push people into poverty and we help them uh, with the wages that they need and the supports that they need to get through this pandemic and thrive in our local communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Barry Innisfil. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I'm uh, very proud and humbled to represent the riding of Barry Innisfil, and it's a great riding because we have so many local businesses and so many local charities that are really thriving this time of year and really providing hope and giving a little in our community. So I want to uh, take this opportunity to remind people to give a little, choose local, and uh, think of charities that have just uh, started ramping up, like the. Innisfil Rotary Club through their Innisfil Christmas for Kids campaign, uh, where they're getting help with Johnny Burger. So thank you, Johnny Burger, for all your efforts. And of course, looking forward to their Santa Claus drive-through parade. We also have Christmas Cheer and Berry, who's operating for about 47 years. It's incredible the work they, they do with local charities as well. And of course, Youth Haven's Boxes of Hope, uh, where they provide hope for so many youth across Simcoe County. But it's not just our youth and our young people and our families, it's also our seniors. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the seniors Association who's gathering boxes for our seniors in our community to lift up spirits and get back into that great uh, holiday spirit. We also have, of course, the second annual Light It Up Innisfil um, campaign by Jennifer Richardson and her family as we try to always keep up with the Richardsons and it's difficult sometimes, Speaker, because they're doing a lot. Uh, but they are uh, doing their Light It Up Innisfil event this year where proceeds will be going to, uh, of course, the, the Innisfil Food Bank in Christmas for Kids. Last year they had about 100 and 39 houses participate in the uh, campaign of lit lighting up their uh, the ornaments and Christmas decorations outside their homes, and they raised over $2,500. So this year, we're looking for even more. So support local and your charities. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. That concludes our member statements for this morning. I'm going to ask that our pages assemble. It is my honour and pleasure to introduce this group of legislative pages. From the riding of Don Valley West, Claire Ann. From the riding of Etobicoke North, Rashi Bargava. From the riding of Brantford Brant, Eleanor Buma. Riding of Parkdale High Park, Eleanor Carter. From the riding of Whitby, Nathaniel Gardner. From the riding of University Rosedale, Joel Cronus. From the riding of York Simcoe, Hayden Lai. From the riding of Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill, Serena. Norona. From the riding of Brampton North, Felicia Pagulian. From the riding of Markham Unionville, Athesha Cires. From Beaches East York, Isabella Sermon. And from the riding of Davenport, Alfie Tabichnik. On behalf of all the members, I wish you our, our welcome and best wishes and our thanks for all the help that you're going to give us in the coming weeks. Thank you. Now back to work. <laughs> Thank you. I'm also very pleased to inform the House that Paige Isabella Sermon from the riding of Beaches East York is today's Paige Captain. And we have with us today at Queen's Park her mother, Sarah Cahill, and her father, Matthew Sermon. Welcome to the Legislative Assembly of Ontario. I recognize the government house leader on a point of order. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if you seek it, you'll find uh, unanimous consent to allow members to make statements in remembrance for the late uh, Mr. Hugh Edigoffer with five minutes allotted to Her Majesty's government, five minutes allotted to Her Majesty's loyal opposition, and five minutes allotted to the independent members as a group. Mr. Calandra is seeking the unanimous consent of the House to allow members to make statements in remembrance of the late Mr. Hugh Eddie Hoffer, with five minutes allotted to Her Majesty's government, five minutes allotted to Her Majesty's loyal opposition, and five minutes allotted to the independent members as a group. Agreed? Agreed. I recognize the member for Perth Wellington. Well, thank you, Speaker. It's truly an honour to pay tribute today to Hugh Edigoffer, someone who exemplified the very best of public service as MPP, as Speaker, and throughout his life. Who was Hugh Edigoffer? When he passed away in July uh, 2019, we read a simple statement in Hugh's obituary that was characteristic of the man's decency and humility. He was a small-town businessman, mayor, town councillor, member of provincial parliament, and speaker of the Ontario legislature. He was indeed those things, but to his family, friends, constituents, and colleagues in public service, and all those who knew him, he was much more. Hugh was a community builder. After graduating from college, Hugh returned to his hometown of Mitchell to work in the family business in a retail clothing store his grandfather founded in 1924. With an early sense of public service, Hugh got involved in local service clubs, including the Lions Club and the Chamber of Commerce. In the 1950s and early 60s, uh, Hugh's dedication to community led him to local politics. He held various municipal offices, including councillor and mayor of Mitchell. With his experience, it's probably not surprising that as an NPP, he, support, he supported community building projects. He knew their value. And that was my first experience with Hugh. 
I met him in the late 80s when I was on the building committee for the Moncton Arena, now called the Alma Logan Recreation Complex. We needed money to build it. These were the days before constituency offices, uh, so we went to see Hugh at his home in Mitchell. He welcomed us, he heard us, and he acted. He delivered an astonishing $600,000 in funding. And when the project was complete, he added, uh, the grand opening, he added to the grand opening ceremony, bringing along another distinguished community builder, Lincoln Alexander, then the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. Just as an aside on that, uh, the day of the opening speaker, um, we lost Mr. Alexander, and we couldn't find him. Uh, he was, we had a uh, secure room for him, and uh, he wasn't there. So just before the ceremony was to start, his security guards started running around looking for him, and I was on my way to the men's washroom. I went into the washroom, and guess who was in there? Lincoln Alexander. <laughs> Um, and I said, sir, everybody's worried about your, your security and your safety and, and your, 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 um, your um, people are looking for you right now. And he looked at me and he said, oh, I don't think anybody's going to shoot me in Moncton. And, uh, and nobody did. So, uh, so, so we continued on with the ceremony. Years later, after I f uh, f was first elected, I enjoyed sitting down to dinner with Hugh, and that's dinner at noon, with Hugh and the Mitchell Legion at the Mitchell Legion on, on Fridays. He was always supportive and encouraging. And Hugh was determined. Hugh's determination is well known and well respected. But his election results over the years make it unmistakable. He first ran for a seat in the provincial legislature in 1963. Despite receiving nearly 40% of the votes, he was not successful. Four years later, he tried again. His second attempt uh, was a squeaker. He won the seat by only 184 votes. I know how that feels, Mr. Speaker. Having won an election, Hugh didn't rest. He worked hard for his constituents. Throughout the 70s, he won every election by a greater margin than the one before. By the election of 1977, Hugh won almost 70 percent of the votes in the riding of Perth, a plurality larger than any other in the province. Hugh easily won re-election again in 81, 85, and 1987. His progressive conservative opponent in 1977 was Vivian Jarvis, who serves today in my constituency office. And before that election, visit, uh, Vivian visited, visited Hugh and Nancy on their front porch. And she recalls telling Hugh, I'm not running against you. I'm running because we don't have a candidate. <laughs> Hugh was a statesman. It's been said correctly that Hugh elevated his constituents and public service over partisan politics or personal ambition. But he was always a proud Liberal and even served as chairman of the Liberal Caucus. By 1985, Hugh had accumulated considerable knowledge about the workings of the Legislature, having already served as Deputy Speaker in a, minor in a minority parliament. That and a well-earned reputation for impartiality made him the obvious choice to serve as the new Speaker. In his book, Whose Servant I Am, Claire Dale writes, the man who many people felt was one of the most nonpartisan politicians at Queen's Park, became the second speaker of the Legislative Assembly to be elected from the ranks of the opposition. Two weeks later, Frank Miller's government fell, <clears throat> and David Peterson became premier. Dale goes on to write, impartiality became the watchword for Etta Goffer's initial term as speaker. His well-earned reputation for impartiality was tested as Dale also notes, in a series of tough, tough decisions as Speaker. He passed those tests, however, and in 1987 go on to become the, only the third person since the 19th century to have served more than one term as Speaker. Hugh was a constituency, constituency person. Though he may be remembered in the halls of Queen's Park as a statesman and a Speaker, to those, to those of us in Perth County, his greatest legacy is one of his service to his constituents. They were the reason he ran. He was a humble, good-humored people person who cared about his community, and voters rewarded him for it. To this day, it's a story worth remembering, and it's an example worth emulating. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. I recognize the member for London West.
Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. It is a pleasure to rise on behalf of the official opposition to pay tribute to one of the deans of the Ontario Legislature and one of the finest speakers ever to preside in this chamber, Hugh Edikoffer. Hugh Edikoffer served as a Liberal Member of Parliament for the Riding of Perth for 23 years, from 1967 to 1990, and before that as Councillor and Mayor. When he passed away in July 2019, the flags were lowered to half-mast at the Municipal Office in Mitchell, the community where Hugh grew up and where he dedicated most of his life to public service. Former Premier David Peterson first met Edikoffer in 1975 and described describes him as one of the sweetest men on earth, quiet, modest, decent, and kind. He was admired for his nonpartisanship, well-liked by everyone who knew him, and respected by voters across party lines for his strong work ethic and as a champion of rural issues. When Hugh was first elected, MPPs did not have budgets to run constituency offices or to hire staff. Hugh had inherited the Edikoffer family clothing business and held constituency hours at the back of the store. Peterson told me that Hugh was a smart guy and realized it didn't hurt that constituents could buy a pair of gloves on the way in or out. <laughs> A decade later, in 1985, Stratford Mayor Dan Matheson met Edikoffer when he signed up as a 14-year-old campaign volunteer. Dan remembers Hugh picking him up to go out canvassing or to put up signs. When Dan started volunteering on his own, Hugh always took the time to talk to Dan afterwards and ask how the canvas went. For Hugh, everything was a teachable moment. He not only asked Dan what people were saying at the door, but also what Dan had learned from the experience. Hugh returned to Queen's Park that year, becoming the second speaker in Ontario's history to be elected from the ranks of the opposition during the short-lived Frank Miller government. <clears throat> he became one of a handful of speakers to serve more than one term when he was elected again in 1987 under Liberal Premier David Peterson. And although he did not run in the 1990 election, he served briefly as Speaker under NDP Premier Bob Ray until a new Speaker could be elected, making Hugh Edikoffer the only Ontario Speaker ever to serve under Conservative, Liberal and NDP governments. Former NDP MPP David, David Warner succeeded Edikoffer as Speaker in 1990. Although there is no formal expectation that the outgoing Speaker will attend the election of the new Speaker, Hugh was there when David assumed the role in 1990 and was one of the first to offer his congratulations. David and Hugh would continue to see each other in the years that David served. And like every Speaker after him, including yourself, David considered Hugh a great friend. For David, Hugh exemplified the proud tradition of speakers, always even-handed, always fair, always balanced, and always respectful. He had a nice sense of humor, too, and was famous for his calm and patient, I'll wait when things got out of hand. Thirteen years after Hugh stepped down, John Wilkinson was elected as Perth Wellington MPP and regarded Hugh as a treasured mentor and role model. John said there was only one person in the riding who actually watched the legislative channel, and that was Hugh, when he was not out golfing at the Mitchell Golf and Country Club. John and Hugh shared similar paths, both liberals, both with young families when they entered political life, and both unsuccessful in their first run for office. John recalls Hugh telling him after that initial defeat, don't give up, I did it, and you can do it too. When John won in 2003, he asked Hugh for his most important piece of advice. Hugh said, if your wife ever calls you and asks you to go home, go home. Always put your family first because they will, they will be there long after politics is over. Hugh lived by those same words. For him, family was everything. He was devoted to his late wife, Nancy, and was a loving and joyful father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. To his family, we say a profound thank you for sharing such a kind, gracious, and loyal public servant with the people of Perth and the province of Ontario.
Thank you very much. Next, I'll recognize the member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. I'm honoured to rise today to pay tribute to Hugh Edighoffer. Hugh's accomplishments are very impressive. He was a small business owner, a mayor, a town councillor, MPP, and Speaker of the Legislature. But most of all, he was a decent, respectful, and respected person. When he was appointed Speaker of the Legislature in 1985 from the opposition benches, he was nominated and seconded by the three party leaders serving in the legislature at the time. And I think that says so much about Hugh's character. Former Premier David Peterson described him as a model to everyone, consensus oriented. He made friends across party lines. Hugh was a model MPP. And for those of us who currently serve in the legislature, someone who we can learn from. I'm inspired by his commitment to working across party lines. And I just want to say to Mr. Edgehoffer's family, you must be so proud of his accomplishments and the fact that so many MPPs from so many different parties so respect Hugh's character and his public service. Thank you for sharing him with us. Thank you very much. Next, I'll recognize the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And it's an honour to say a few words of tribute to Hugh Alden Edighoffer, small businessman, mayor, town councillor, member of provincial parliament for Perth, and speaker of the Ontario Legislature. He served this assembly on behalf of the people of Perth for 23 years. He was known for his impartiality and as to be as, as one of the most non-partisan members of this House, qualities that served him well in this chamber. I spoke to Jerry Phillips, who most of us know, a former member, who served with him from 1987 to 1990, and this is what he had to say about Hugh. He was really a role model for Speaker. He, were, he, he commanded respect for himself and, by extension, for this Assembly. So he presided over this legislature in changing times. There was the Accord of 1985, the televising of debates and other technological changes, the transfer of responsibility to the Speaker for the legislative precinct. And he was the only Speaker to serve under Conservative, Liberal and New Democratic administrations in Ontario's history. But he left much more than that behind. So I was talking to John Wilkinson, MPP for Perth, and then he said when he got here, more than a decade after Hugh had left, staff at the Assembly would routinely ask him, how is Mr. Speaker, in reference to Hugh? He obviously left a very lasting impression on many people. It strikes me that what made him unique is that he listened and they took a genuine interest in the people who were speaking to him and what they were talking to him about. Fairness, impartiality, taking a genuine interest. All those things, all those qualities set him apart. All of us who sit here and all of us, all those who've gone before us, and especially those who have to travel distances, know how much time we give up from our families. It's a big sacrifice. Hugh Edekhofer did that for 23 years to make his community, our province, and this assembly a better place. Being separated from our families, well, that's something we all accept as part of the job. But when you become speaker, something else happens. You become separated from your other family, your caucus colleagues. You know, Hugh served as Liberal caucus chair for a long time. These are people that you're on a journey with. They're like a family. And by virtue of the office, you need to back away. You don't spend as much time together. That's a big sacrifice. Speaker, I think the people who make the greatest sacrifice are actually our families. They give up a lot to allow us to be here and try to build better communities and a better province for everybody. So to Hugh's family, his late, late wife Nancy, his children, Susan, Katie, Bob, and Jan. 
his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren, his sisters Maxine, Mary, Loy, and their families. We can't thank you enough for allowing Hugh to be here, to support him, to do the kind of things that he did here to make Ontario a better place, to make his community a better place, and to make this assembly a better place for all of us here. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the members for their tributes, and I know that all members join me in uh, giving thanks to uh, the family of Hugh Eddie Hoffer and offering thanks for his life and public service. Thank you very much. Point of order. Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if you seek it, uh, you will find uh, unanimous consent to move a motion without notice respecting, uh, respecting the arrangement of the House business to accommodate the Indigenous Art Unveiling Ceremony this Thursday. The House Leader is seeking the unanimous consent of the House to move a motion without notice respecting the arrangement of House business to accommodate the Indigenous Art Unveiling Ceremony this Thursday. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, that immediately following the afternoon routine on Thursday, November 18, 2021, the House shall adjourn to allow for an unveiling ceremony to take place in the chamber and that the ceremony be broadcast on the Aunt Parle network and a full Hansard transcript of the ceremony be prepared. And notwithstanding Standing Order 101A, the ballot item uh, numbers 12 and 13 be considered consecutively on Tuesday, November 23, 2021, during the time for private members' public business. The House Leader has moved that immediately following the routine, afternoon routine on Thursday, November 18, 2021, the House shall adjourn to allow for an unveiling ceremony to take place in the Chamber. That the ceremony be broadcast on the Aunt Parle Network and a full Hansard transcript of the ceremony be prepared. And notwithstanding Standing Order 101A, that ballot item numbers 12 and 13 be considered consecutively on Tuesday, November 23, 2021, during the time for private members' public business. Is it the pleasure of the House that the motion carry? Carried. Carried.